that would severely affect food production, human disease, and mortality. There are also iconic American companies that have made the considered business judgment that climate change is real and we need to prepare, but we can get more to that later in the colloquy. Uh, yet, in spite of all this, and these are all new reports, on top of, since this 97% number was established, yet the conservative media and some of my colleagues in Congress seem, seem to think it's just fine to ignore what these scientists are saying. Let me illustrate this with an analogy. Say you went to a doctor, and the doctor told you, you know, you better start eating more sensibly and start exercising because you are tremendously overweight. And I see from your family history that you have a family history of heart disease. Your father died of a heart attack at uh, an early age. So you, you really got to go on a diet and start working out a little bit. And you say, you know what? I'd like a second opinion. So you go to a second doctor and he says, okay, look, I, you have a family history of heart disease. Uh, your father died of a heart attack at a young age. You weigh over 300 pounds. And you smoke three packs a day. Your cholesterol is just out of control. Your blood pressure is through the roof. It would be just irresponsible of me as a doctor not to immediately send you to this place at Mayo Clinic that I know. And I, you know, I think it'll, you, you got to go there. And you say, you know, thanks, doctor, but I'd love a, I, I want a third opinion. You go to the third doctor, and the third doctor reads your chart and looks at you and goes, wow, I am amazed that you are still alive. And you say, you know what, I'd like a fourth opinion. And then you go to the fourth doctor, and you go to the fifth doctor, and you go to the sixth doctor, and you go to the seventh doctor. They're all saying the same thing. But you keep asking for more opinion. Finally, finally, you go to the 25th doctor. And the 25th doctor says, it's a good thing you came to me because all this diet and exercise would have been a complete waste. You're doing just fine. Those other doctors are in the pockets of the fresh fruits and vegetable people. You know, enjoy life, eat whatever you want, keep smoking, watch a lot of TV. That's my advice to you. And then you learn that the doctor was paid his salary by the makers of Twinkies which, don't get me wrong, are a delicious snack food and should be eaten in moderation. Am I making sense here, is what I'm asking. And it's actually quite a good example, Senator Franken, because we have some of the phony science that has attacked the science of climate change that is actually a pretty good comparison to what you described. Take, for instance, the uh, bogus Marshall Institute. This is an institute that was founded in 1984 by a physicist who had been the chief scientist behind the tobacco industry's campaign to convince Americans that tobacco was actually okay for you and that there was doubt about whether it would actually do you any harm. Uh, a few years later, he organized something that was called the Oregon Petition, which denied that climate change was happening. Now, they phonied up the Oregon petition to look like official papers of the National Academy of Sciences. So the National Academy of Sciences had to take the unusual step of responding that the petition, quote, does not reflect the conclusion of expert reports of the Academy, and further that it was, quote, a deliberate attempt to mislead. So he's expert in tobacco being okay for you. Suddenly he turns up as a climate denier. He phonies up his report to look like was he part of a foundation a at this Academy. point. This is uh, funded by the Marshall Institute. There's another uh -huh. one. There are lots of these out there. I'll just use two <laughs> examples. The other one is the Heartland 
Institute. It's another so-called think tank with the same backers from tobacco and the fossil fuel industry, founded also in 1984. It's written reports to try to manufacture doubt about climate science and about the risks of secondhand smoke. Heartland received nearly $700,000 from ExxonMobil through 2006. Uh, their bogus policy documents include false claims that climate change is poorly understood and simply wrong assertions that there is no consensus about the causes, effects, or future rate of global warming. Picking just these two, but there are others in the constellation of bogus science, they're commonly funded by the Bradley Foundation, the folks who brought you the John Birch Society, by the SCAFE Foundations, which are constantly behind right-wing causes, by the Olin Foundations, constantly behind right-wing and against public health causes, by ExxonMobil, and by the Koch brothers. So, although it may look like different voices are appearing, it's actually the same money speaking through different fronts. This is an interesting area. Uh, there is a well-established link between the scientists who have worked for think tanks like the George C. Marshall Institute, the Heartland Institute, and other foundations, which were funded at first by tobacco money and then since then by the fossil fuels industry. These scientists have been paid to spread misinformation in order to cast doubt. Cast doubt. That's all they got to do. On a whole host of scientific issues, first about tobacco, then about acid rain, then about the hole in the ozone layer, and now about climate change. Take tobacco, for, for example. Scientists were paid to testify in court that there, were no, that there was no proof that smoking caused cancer or was addictive, even after the industry scientists knew darn well that cigarettes were addictive and did cause cancer and heart disease. In fact, the tobacco industry was found guilty in 2004 of plotting to conceal the health risks and the addictiveness of cigarettes from the public. The judge found that the tobacco industry had, quote, devised and executed a scheme to defraud consumers and potential consumers about the hazards of cigarettes, hazards that their own internal company documents proved they had known since, about the, since the 1950s. And the whole purpose of this scheme was to provide misinformation to confuse the public, to manufacture doubt. And that is what is happening right now with climate change. Public data from the Security and Exchange Commission and from charitable organization reports to the IRS show that between 2000 and 2000, uh, 2005 and 2008, ExxonMobil gave about $9 million to groups linked to climate change denial, while foundations associated with the private oil company Coke Industries gave nearly $25 million. The third major funder was the American Petroleum Institute. All in all, the energy industry spent hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars, on lobbying against climate change legislation between 1999 and 2010, including a large spike in spending from 2008 to 2010. And it's not enough that they pay a stable of paid-for scientists to create doubt, to create phony science that raises uh, the level of doubt. Uh, they also go out of their way to attack legitimate scientists. You wouldn't think that this would carry much weight in a proper debate but amplified by the corporate money behind it and designed, as you say, with the purpose not to win the argument, but just to create doubt so that the public moves on, it has actually worked. One example of this attack on lifetime scientists has been the phony so-called climate gate scandal, which was an effort to derail 
international climate science and climate negotiations? Uh, climate gate. Sometimes you and I refer to it as climate, climate gate. Gate, in fact, because climate the real gate scandal gate. here wasn't what happened with the scientists. The real scandal was the phony attack on the scientists. Uh, I thank my my colleague for bringing this up. Let me, let, let's talk about that. After this is a leak of thousands of emails from scientists at the University of East Anglia's climate research unit back in 2009, and this was done right before the Copenhagen conference, right? Is that? I believe that's correct. Yeah. Okay, and the conservative media, and remember, this doubt is then amplified in the conservative echo chamber. Talk radio, etc. Um, you know what it is, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, Fox News, etc. And uh, the conservative media just pounds, taking quotes out of context to sensationalize this scandal. Scandal. Now, most of the attacks are directed at an email by Phil Jones, a climate scientist working with the East Anglia's Climatic Research Unit, in which he, in this email, is referred to using, quote, Mike's nature's trick of adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years to hide the decline. Mike's nature's trick of adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years to hide the decline. Now, that sounds very bad. Trick, hide the decline. And that went viral. In the conservative media's evidence that the scientific consensus on climate change was a giant hoax. We even had a member of this body say that the science behind this consensus, quote, is the same science that through climate gate has been totally rebuffed and no longer legitimate, either in reality or in the eyes of the American people and the people around the world. But it turns out that the trick being referred to in the email is actually just a technique to, make you, to use the most accurate data available. Pre-1960, temperature data would include measurements from thermometers, tree rings, and other so-called temperature proxies. Post-1960, this is the trick, they excluded tree ring data from some specific kinds of trees that were widely recognized by the scientific community to be unreliable after 1960. So the decline refers that he refers to in this isn't a decline in global temperatures, as the deniers claim. In fact, since 1960, we've had pretty good measurement of temperature around the world with things like thermometers. But they knew this tree ring gave an apparent decline in temperature, as measured by these specific kinds of trees that were known to be inaccurate compared to all the sensors we have for measuring. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of measurements of, of the temperature around the Earth every minute, every day. So this was the trick, a technique to use the most accurate data available of global temperatures from things again, called thermometers, and one that excluded Dadley, widely known to the scientific community to be inaccurate. That is what the trick was, that's all. That's what Phil Jones was referring to in his email. Ironically, he was just trying to be precise. It provoked considerable review afterwards because of the alarmist claims that were made in this phony attack on the climate science. And a number of pretty respectable organizations took a look at this. One was the university itself. And the university itself reached the conclusion on the specific allegations made against the behavior of CRU scientists, we find that their rigor and honesty 
as scientists, are not in doubt. In addition, we do not find that their behavior has prejudiced the balance of advice given to policymakers. In particular, we did not find any evidence of behavior that might undermine the conclusions of the IPCC assessments. That was the University Review. Not enough, the National Science Foundation also looked at this. They could be biased. Well, that's why we go on to the National Science <laughs> Foundation, okay. which uh, found no direct evidence of research misconduct and therefore said, we are closing this investigation with no further action. And Parliament looked into it as well, because the university was in uh, Great Britain. And the House of Commons did an investigation. The House of, Common, House of Commons investigation concluded that the uh, challenged actions by Professor Jones and others, quote, were in line with common practice in the climate science community. They went on to say, insofar as we've been able to consider accusations of dishonesty, we consider that there is no case to answer. No case to answer. Finally, they said, we have found no reason in this unfortunate episode to challenge the scientific consensus as expressed by Professor Beddington that, quote, global warming is happening and that it is induced by human activity. So the studies that looked at whether the climate science was phony or whether the climate gate scandal was phony have all come down supporting the science and pointing out the climate gate should properly be known as Climate Gate Gate because it was the scandal that was phony. Now, let's make a, a, a distinction here between people who are climate skeptics and people who are climate deniers. This is kind of an important distinction. There's nothing wrong with skepticism. In fact, we love skeptics. Skeptics, scientists, are by nature skeptical. If you have a new idea, you need to prove it conclusively, that you're right, before 97% of scientists will believe you. you know, this, is, this is why an over, I mean, that's already happened for an overwhelming majority of climate scientists who have concluded, again, that global warming is happening and that it is caused by mankind. But there are a small number of them who still have questions. On the other hand, a climate denier is someone who won't be convinced no matter how overwhelming the evidence is. And as I pointed out, a lot of these deniers are being paid by polluters uh, to say what they want. Now, shortly after climate gate, or climate gate gate, a physicist at the University of California, Berkeley, Richard Muller, who is skeptical of the prevailing views on climate sciences, on science, decided to test the temperature record. Muller, a skeptic, started the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Study to re-evaluate the record and weed out scientific biases. And this was gold to climate deniers. In fact, among the funders for the Mueller study were, was the Charles Koch Foundation. But things didn't really work out the way that the deniers had hoped. In late March, Dr. Mueller testified before the House Science and Technology Committee with his initial, initial findings on temperature increases since the late 1950s. This is what he said. Our result is very similar to that reported by the prior groups. A rise of about 0.7 degrees Celsius since 1957. This agreement with the prior analysis surprised us because they were skeptics. 
Mueller's team basically recreated the blade of the so-called hockey stick graph or the temperature graph that had come under attack in climate gate. Now this graph here, this shows Mueller's es estimates against the previous estimates. Okay? Now then this, just this, the, Mueller's is Berkeley, is black. And you'll see it's just identical. Pretty much. This past October, Dr. Mueller's group released its findings, and to the dismay of skeptics and deniers, these findings further confirm the prevailing science behind climate change and the work of the scientists attacked during Climate Gate Gate. And you see the results on the chart. This, this is this gray thing is like, a, it's a gray band indicates 95% statistical spatial uncertainty. But it's really exactly, and his, his line is the black line, it's exactly what the other scientists came, uh, measured. The summary of the findings begins by saying bluntly, global warming is real. And goes on to say, our biggest surprise was that the new results agreed so closely with the warming values published previously by other teams in the U.S. and U.K., including East Anglia. This confirms that these studies were done carefully and that potential biases identified by climate change skeptics did not seriously affect their conclusions. So even though these claims that the consensus on global warming is a hoax have been refuted so convincingly by a skeptic, no less, funded by Charles Koch, no less. Some of the deniers keep repeating them. The science is settled and climate gate or climate gate gate was just a big distraction. So now let's move on and figure out how we're going to attack the challenge of climate change. The, clim the challenge of climate change being extremely real. One of the things that is so frustrating about this campaign of phony manufactured doubt is that in real life, we are seeing the predictions of climate science come true around us. Climate sciences, scientists predicted that the atmosphere would warm, and the atmosphere is warming. Climate scientists predict that the ocean would absorb heat, and sure enough, the ocean has absorbed heat and ocean waters are warming. Climate scientists predicted that the ocean would absorb CO2 and that that would lower the pH level of our ocean waters. The ocean is now more acidic than it has been in two million years, threatening coral reefs, shellfish, and the tiny creatures like plankton that make up the base of the entire oceanic food chain. Climate scientists predicted glaciers and Arctic sea ice would melt, and sure enough, we're seeing record melting. You just saw that notorious left-wing publication, USA Today, federal report, Arctic much worse since 2006. Federal officials say the Arctic region has changed dramatically in the past five years for the worse. It's melting at a near record pace, and it's darkening and absorbing too much of the sun's heat. Climate scientists predicted ecosystem shifts, and we are seeing ecosystem shifts, whether it's million-plus acre forests in the American West, dead to the bark beetle, gone from being green and healthy forests to just mile after mile, of brown and dead trees. The bark beetle is doing this. What's happening? Why, how that relates to climate change? The bark beetle relates to climate change because what was keeping those trees free from the bark beetle was cold winters that killed off the bark beetle larvae. As temperatures have warmed, the larvae live through the winters and they attack the trees. So trees that were protected by cold winters are no longer protected and there are literally millions of acres of forest lost in the West. On a smaller scale, but more important to me in my home state of Rhode Island, the preeminent uh, fish 
that was taken out of Narragansett Bay was called the Winter Flounder. My wife wrote her PhD thesis about the Winter Flounder. It was a very significant cash crop for our fishermen. It is now virtually gone because the mean winter water temperature of Narragansett Bay is up nearly four degrees. Scientists also predicted that we would be loading the dice for extreme weather with climate change. And we are seeing an unusual amount of extreme weather. The uh, disasters, uh, the number of billion dollar disasters has hit a record. A recent press clip noted, I quote, with an almost biblical onslaught of twisters, floods, snow, drought, heat, and wildfire, the U.S. in 2011 has seen more weather catastrophes that caused at least a billion dollars in damage than it did in all of the 1980s, even after the dollar figures from back then are adjusted for inflation. Serious, grown-up, corporate entities like the biggest insurance companies the world, in the world are noticing this and are concerned. Munich Reinsurance has written the following. The high number of weather-related natural catastrophes and record temperatures both globally and in different regions of the world provide further indications of advancing climate change. Throughout the corporate world you are seeing this. Here's a list of companies who've gone public with the need for us to do something about climate change. Uh, American Electric, Bank of America, Chrysler, Cisco, DuPont, Duke Energy, eBay, Toyota, Timberland, Starbucks, Google, GM, General Electric, Ford, Siemens, PepsiCo, Nike, Michelin, John Deere. I'm picking them somewhat at random, but these aren't fringe organizations. These are the core of the American business community, and they recognize what is going on. I want to single out one company, which is Coca-Cola. I was going to bring to the floor the new can of Coca-Cola as an exhibit to demonstrate that this major international corporation, this huge American success story based in Atlanta, has taken probably the most iconic product in America, the Coke can, and has redesigned it to reflect what the climate change is doing in the Arctic and to polar bears. Unfortunately, my Coke can was confiscated by the cloakroom staff because I'm not allowed to bring exhibits on the floor unless they're this. I should have snuck it out here, but that's why I don't have it. But Coca-Cola is a serious American business, and here's what they say. The consensus on climate science is increasingly unequivocal. Global climate change is happening, and man-made greenhouse gas emissions are a crucial factor. The implications of climate change for our planet are profound and wide-ranging, with expected impacts on biodiversity, water resources, public health, and agriculture. So you put against that the core of the business community, iconic companies like Coca-Cola, putting their very label behind the need to address climate change, and you put against that the phony baloney paid for scientists that are creating this doubt, and it is time to close this episode. You know, I'm kind of glad you bring up the phony baloney doubt, especially and, and these extreme weather uh, that we've been experiencing. Uh, some of my colleagues have pointed, uh, from the other side, have pointed to the extreme snowstorms, or at least one of my colleagues in the Northeast over the last several winters is evidence that global warming is, is a hoax. Again, this is completely misleading. Intensifying blizzards aren't due to the earth getting cooler. They're due to increased moisture content in the air. Warmer air holds more moisture. Now, basically, it doesn't have to be that cold for it to snow. It just has to be 32 degrees or below. And what is snow? It's frozen water. So it's about water. The atmosphere is now holding more water because it is warmer. Warmer air holds more water than cooling air. The main point is that these increased natural disasters have real costs. A few months ago, we had a hearing in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee on the Forest Services Management of the Intense 
forest fires we had out west this year. In that hearing, the Forest Service Chief, Tom Tidwell, told me that he's seeing longer forest fire seasons out west, more than 30 days longer than what used to be, uh, than what we used to have even a decade ago. And Forest Service climate experts, these are scientists, have said that a major contributing factor to these longer fire seasons and more intense fires is climate change. And the cost of these fires for all levels of government and to society as a whole is huge and it's something that members of both sides of the aisle recognize and are concerned with. Several of my Republican colleagues in that hearing expressed their concerns about the cost. They referred to a report from the Western Forestry Leadership Coalition which estimates that the combined direct and indirect cost of forest fires can be as much as 30 times the cost of fire suppression alone. You need to factor in the cost of forest rehabilitation, the loss of tax revenues for local governments, loss of businesses that depend on forest resources and property losses, not to, met, uh, to mention the immeasurable cost of, of lives that were lost due to the fires. I want to underscore for members of this body that when we have discussions about important issues like cost of wildfire response, we are also we're talking about the cost of responding to climate change. If forestry specialists at the U.S. Forest Service tell us that these fires are getting worse due to climate change, we really should be listening to them. And if you don't mind, Senator Franking, if I change elements from fire to water, uh, since I represent the ocean state, another place where climate change is really creating dangerous consequences is in our oceans. And let me just cite a few reports that have come out recently. Climate change in European marine ecosystem research says close to one-third of the carbon dioxide produced by humans from burning fossil fuels and other sources has been absorbed by the oceans since the beginning of industrialization. And that has buffered the cause and effects of climate change. A resulting lowered pH, when carbon goes into the ocean, it acidifies it, it lowers the pH. A resulting lowered pH and saturation states of the carbonate minerals that form the shells and body structures of many marine organisms makes these groups especially vulnerable. The growth of individual coral skeletons and the ability of reefs to remain structurally viable are likely to be severely affected. Continuing acidification may also affect the ability of the oceans to take up CO2, so they won't be absorbing the one-third that they've absorbed any longer. It will stay in the atmosphere, and that atmospheric concentrations will increase even faster. The Annual Review of Marine Science reports that growing human pressures, including climate change, are having profound and diverse consequences for marine ecosystems. These effects are globally pervasive and irreversible on ecological timescales. Direct consequences include increasing ocean temperature and acidity, rising sea level, increased ocean stratification, decreased sea ice, and altered patterns of ocean circulation, precipitation, and fresh water. The context for this is a pretty astounding one, and that is when you look back through history, you don't look at changes in terms of decades or even generations. You look at changes in terms of millions of years. There's a special issue of oceanography with a feature on ocean acidification, and it's called ocean acidification in deep time. We have now an atmosphere, this yes, I'm quoting, an atmosphere that already contains more carbon dioxide than at any time in the last 800,000 years of Earth history, and probably more than has occurred in several tens of millions of years. We've had agriculture, 
as humans for about 10,000 years, to give you an idea of what 800,000 years or several tens of millions of years means. The report goes on, there are no precedents in recent Earth history for what will be the immediate and direct consequences of the release of CO2 into the atmosphere and its concurrent dissolution in the ocean's waters. But we are playing with very dangerous effects when we ignore climate change at the behest of a tiny minority of scientists and their polluter industry folks, funders behind them. And there are folks who, gets, who get the cost of inaction, and that includes the Department of Defense. In its 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review, or QDR, the DOD identified climate and energy as among the major national security challenges that America faces now and in the future. To give you perspective on the significance of this, crafting a strategic approach to climate and energy was alongside other priorities laid out in the QDR with titles like Succeed in Counterinsurgency, Stability, and Counterterrorism Operations, and Prevent Proliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction. This is serious stuff. It matters for DOD because climate change is predicted to increase food and water scarcity increase the spread of disease and spur mass migration and environmental refugees due to more intense storms, floods, and droughts. We had similar testimony, Senator Franken, in the Senate Intelligence Committee. And the witness who testified before us released his testimony before the House Intelligence Committee, and very much the same conclusion. We judge, his testimony read, that global climate change will have wide-ranging implications for U.S. national security interests over the next 20 years, and that factors that would affect U.S. national security interests as a result of climate change would include food and water shortages, increased health problems, including the spread of disease, increased potential for conflict, ground subsidence, the earth lowering, flooding, coastal erosion, extreme weather events, increases in the severity of storms in the Gulf of Mexico, disruptions in U.S. and Arctic infrastructure, and increases in immigration from resource-scarce regions of the world. Now, there are probably climate deniers who will say, well, the, this, that's all part of the conspiracy. The Defense Department is in on it. All those companies are in on it. The intelligence community is in on it. But if there's a hoax, what's more mainstream than National Geographic? Is National Geographic in on it too? Well, they'd have to be because they did a special report a few years ago on climate change. And they showed a polar bear stranded on the melting ice. Here's what they say. It's here. Melting glaciers, heat waves, rising seas, trees flowering earlier, lakes freezing later, migratory birds delaying their flight south. The unmistakable signs of climate change are everywhere. And how do we know this? We know this because of the science. What do they say about the science? How do we know our climate is changing? Historical records, decades of careful observations, and precise measurements, as you said, with things like thermometers around the globe, along with basic scientific principles. And if you think that National Geographic is in on it and you can't have faith in the defense establishment, and you can't have faith in the corporate establishment, and you can't have faith even in National Geographic, perhaps you can have faith in the Pope, who said recently, I hope that all members of the international community can agree on a responsible, credible, 
and supportive response to this worrisome and complex phenomenon, keeping in mind the needs of the poorest populations and of future generations. The press release from Catholic News Service then quotes one of his bishops who says, our climate is changing. This is Cardinal Rodriguez. Urgent action is necessary. And he called on our political leaders around the world, quote, to curb the threat of climate change and set the world on a path to a more just and sustainable future. Okay, well, the Pope. But that, I mean, didn't, didn't the Catholic Church go after Galileo? I mean, look, between the science supporting climate change and the reality of the dangers that climate change brings, we really have to ramp up our efforts to master this challenge. And that means wise investments in clean energy R&D and deployment. They're just a good place to start. Plus, these investments encourage the growth of domestic clean energy, uh, domestic clean energy economy, which, which would create jobs and has created jobs, grow our manufacturing base, and keep us competitive in global energy markets. And that's so important because Germany and China Denmark, countries all over the world are winning this race. Now, one of the great parts about this job is spending half time here and then half time home in Minnesota. Minnesota is a national leader in clean energy. In 2007, Minnesota passed the highest renewable energy standard in the country at the time and all our utilities are on track to meet the goal of 25% renewable by 2025. Our largest utility, XL Energy, is on its way to 30% by 2020. We have universities like the University of Minnesota Morris, which is pushing the frontiers of innovation in greening its campus through a biomass gasification system which provides heating and cooling and electricity, wind turbines to produce power and lead certified buildings. Our farmers have led the country in biofuels and our universities are leading R&D efforts for the transitions to cellulosic and other advanced biofuels. And by the way, the first commercial cellulosic plant that scaled up the commercial level is being built right now. St. Paul has the largest district energy system in North America. It's heating and cooling all of downtown St. Paul with woody biomass. Sage elect Electrochromics is, is a manufacturing plant in Faribault, Minnesota. It has cutting edge windows that use a little photovoltaic cell to control, and they turn, these windows turn completely opaque and block out all UV during the summer. And during the winter, there are these beautiful, huge windows that let in all the light. And it isn't like a Polaroid, it's an incredible technology. The University of Minnesota has just received two grants from the Advanced Research Projects Agency at the Department of Energy. That's ARPA-E. That was patterned after DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency that created the Internet. And across the state, businesses and cities are working together to make our buildings more energy efficient using Minnesota-made technologies like Marvin and Anderson Windows. Minnesota, by the way, is the Silicon Valley of Windows. We have 3M window films or McQuay heating and air conditioning system. Just last month, I partnered with our cities and counties to launch the Back to Work Minnesota initiative, aiming to break down barriers in financing retrofits, retrofitting public and commercial
buildings across Minnesota. And what's great about that, we can, this pays for itself. You finance this and you retrofit a building. It puts people in the building trades to work who are in a depression. And it puts manufacturers who build energy efficient materials and equipment, geothermal furnace systems and furnaces, heat exchange furnaces, pumps. And you save energy, the saved energy, the energy efficiency pays for the retrofit in four or five years and you can capitalize this. And we're finding innovative ways to do that. Every, it, it pays for itself and you lower our carbon footprint. You use less energy, create jobs, save money. It's win, 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 win. This is something we have to do, are insane not to do. We are uh, proud of what is going on in Rhode Island uh, as well. We plan to meet 16% of our energy needs through renewable energy sources by 2020. Uh, and that is on top of a goal to cut energy use by 10%. So we'll cut energy use by 10% and of the remaining 90, get 16% of that out of renewable energy sources. Everybody's getting involved. Utilities, towns, the state, the private sector. One of our cities, East Providence, is right now converting a brownfield which has been vacant for 40 years nearly into New England's largest solar installation. And as you say, there will be a payback and they will earn money on that for their taxpayers. Our state of Rhode Island has been the national leader at how you map and prepare for offshore wind development. And so in the state and federal waters off of the coast of Rhode Island, we are positioned to lead the country in offshore wind siting with all of the jobs that building those giant wind turbines and assembling them and erecting them offshore create. Uh, we have exciting companies like Bioprocess Algae of Portsmouth, Rhode Island, which has just opened a spectacular facility in Iowa, which takes the exhaust from ethanol plants and runs it through algae farms and creates biofuels. They're at the cutting edge of that technology. So when you see these great technologies and these great opportunities, you know, in this colloquy, we are ending on what I hope is a very strong positive note for the economy. If we can pull away from the lies and the phony science and the polluter paid nonsense that has so far distracted us from doing our duty as a nation, we can get into the race that is going on on this world for the energy future. The economy of this century is going to be driven by the six trillion dollar clean energy industry. We do not want to fall out the back of that race and leave it to the Chinese and to the Europeans. We want to be winning that race and the jobs and the economic success that that can bring can not only power our homes and our factories, it can power our economy back to security for all Americans. Uh, I want to thank you, Senator Franken, for inviting me to join you in this colloquy, and I think our time is coming close to expire, so I'll yield uh, the remainder of our time to you and ask unanimous consent that uh, Senator Franken be allowed as much time as he needs to conclude. Uh, but thank you very much. This has been a wonderful uh, opportunity for me. Senator Without objection. Uh, thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for your leadership in this. Boy, algal, and by the way, that's the pronunciation of al, I thought it was algal, but algal energy is amazing. That we are fueling jet fighters, jet fuel made from algae. Both the President and Energy Secretary Chu have, have said that we're in America's Sputnik moment. And they're absolutely right. Fifty years ago, we were in a global space race. Today, we're in a global clean energy race. Whichever country takes the most action today to develop and make clean energy technologies will dominate the global economy in this century. That means 
supporting financing for clean energy and energy efficiency projects. It means tax credits for clean energy manufacturing, providing incentives for retrofitting residential and public and commercial buildings. It means supporting basic research and keeping alive initiatives that support clean energy technology innovation. These need to be our priorities as we make energy policy and budget decisions. We, we can pay for these investments by cutting expensive, outdated subsidies for oil companies that are making record profits. There is a lot more to be done if we're going to win this global clean energy race, but it's not going to be easy. It means unifying as a country and starting to do things differently than we've been doing them. Albert Einstein said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. I'm convinced that we can win this race. No other country is better positioned, but first, people need to understand the stakes. Climate change is real. And failure to address it is bad for our standing in the global economy, bad for the federal budget, and bad for our national security. We can do better than that for our children and our grandchildren and posterity. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. And I yield the floor. Just the absence of a quorum. Oh, I, object. <laughs> I take that back, but Mr. President. Senator from uh, Delaware, there is not the absence of a quorum, but I appreciate my colleague uh, mentioning that. I, I said to him earlier, uh, earlier today, or maybe yesterday, he, uh, Senator Frank, it's a joy to have around here, and. Uh, some of us know he was. He brings a, also a, a real special touch for trying to put uh, infuse some civility uh, in this place uh, again. And came up a couple a year or two ago with the idea of a secret Santa exchange. And we actually did it this year. And I, I don't know if there's been any mention of that tonight, but my uh, my secret Santa turns out to be the senator from uh, from Alaska, uh, Senator Murkowski, Senator our presiding officer's co colleague, and. Uh, she gave me this uh, most wonderful uh, gift, that, uh, handmade gift, that she and her staff actually created. And Delaware is the only state that doesn't have a national park. And what they did is they created on a sheet of paper, sort of like this, only it was like you know, a firm sheet of paper, not like a regular sheet of paper. But they literally made, this was the state of Delaware, and they created the national park, so we got pop-up national park with, with a, a bus going around and our pictures as it riding along in the bus. It was just, I don't know, care what else I get for Christmas, but that's going to be the best Christmas present probably for this year. I'm, I don't see how anybody tops that, but that's not only providing some civility, but also some levity in a place which could, could use both. So I thank you for, for all, all your contributions, but especially that one. And I'll ask for something more, more, uh, more serious. And what I want to do is talk about the, uh, the, uh, the regulation that, uh, that um, EPA has been working on for, uh, for a while. It's called the Boiler Mac, and the idea is uh, maximum achievable uh, technology here. And the, uh, if you go back in, in time, we go back to about 1990, actually like 1970 in this country, the Congress passed in President uh, signed, Richard Nixon actually signed Clean Air Act uh, of 1970. Republican president, we had a Republican uh, head of EPA. And the, um, that uh, was impl implemented at a time when we had the Cuyahoga River up in Cleveland, Ohio on fire and all kinds of terrible things happening in our environment in this country. And uh, better things started to happen, not just for cleaner water and wastewater treatment and air, but uh, it led in 1990 to the, the passage of the Clean Air Act Amendments of, of 1990. One of the uh, requirements of Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990, and that legislation, the Congress, Congress directed EPA to finalize uh, regulations to reduce uh, what we call air toxics from uh, boilers by the year 2000. So, 
Clean Air Act uh, was adopted in 1970, 1990, 20 years later. Clean Air Act amendments was adopted, and in that uh, Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, Congress said, EPA, we want you to uh, finalize regulations to reduce air toxics from boilers by the year 2000, 10 years. And uh, the year 2000 uh, came and went uh, without uh, really any action. And the uh, Bush administration, George uh, W. Bush administration, finalized the rule, I think it was in uh, the year 2004, but they excluded uh, many industrial boilers from having to, uh, to comply. As it turned out, there's a lot of boilers in this uh, country, and I was uh, stunned to find out there's about one and a half million uh, boilers in this country. A lot of them are fairly small. You know, a lot of them are in schools or churches or smaller buildings, hospitals. But a bunch of them are pretty good size. But uh, in any event, Bush administration in the year 2004 came up with a, a rule, a proposed rule, but they excluded uh, many industrial boilers from having to, to comply. And in fact, the, the rule may not have just been proposed, might have actually been finalized. But as a result, the, the regulation was vacated in 2007, three years later, by the Circuit Court of Appeals right here in the, the District of, of Columbia. So 2004, EPA finally gets around to finalizing the rule. They've been recalled uh, to do uh, some 14 years earlier by the Congress. And three years later, the courts, uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals knocks it down, vacates, uh, vacates that, uh, that rule on boilers. It was not until uh, June of uh, 2010, and that is uh, a full 10 years after the congressional uh, deadline for action. It was not until 2010 that the EPA issued a proposal for boiler air toxic rules that addressed all the major uh, emitters all the major emitters. If I could, let me just ask one of the pages that are sitting up here. Uh, there's a, uh, can I come here for just a second, please? It's a little bit out of order. But I want to make a, a request of one of our pages, if you would, to go back in the cloakroom and uh, see if you can find for me, here we go. And uh, you can actually take that with you. Find for me, if you would, please, um, a chart. It's in color, so if you could just bring that back. But somebody could bring a, a tripod up. That would be, uh, that would be great. But, uh, and Mr. President, I think it's what we call an audible in, uh, in Delaware. So. But not until uh, 10 years after the deadline did the EPA provide uh, some action, and they gave us a proposal for the air toxics rules that addressed all the major emitters. As with uh, most uh, air pollution regulation these days, EPA was under court order to finalize the rule by a set date. So the court had said uh, to EPA, we want you to finalize the rule by a set date. And that date was uh, the beginning of this year, January of 2011. Now, during the public uh, comment period, the EPA received thousands of comments, thousands of comments, and new information from, among others, from industry. In fact, they received so much uh, in the way of comments and new information in December of 2010, and that was like as a month before the, the, the date set by, under the court order to finalize the rule. But a, a month before that date uh, was to occur, uh, EPA asked the courts a month before the January 2011 deadline to extend the deadline for promulgating the final air toxic standards to April of next year, April of 2012. The courts uh, said, no, don't think so. Said, uh, EPA, you've had enough time to finish. They allowed EPA only until January 21st of this year to go ahead and actually promulgate these, uh, these regulations. So even though uh, EPA didn't have a, uh, a lot of time to process uh, the comments, uh, EPA was able to finalize a rule in February of this year that yielded the same benefits. I think this is pretty interesting. Uh, a rule that realized the same benefits in terms of re reducing, uh, reducing uh, toxic emissions, mercury and arsenic, lead, that kind of thing. Same level of uh, reductions in, uh, in those emissions uh, as in the uh, June uh, 2010 proposals they made, but they cut in half the cost of compliance. That's pretty impressive, isn't it, I think? Cut in half the cost of compliance. Got the same amount of reductions in emissions of these air toxic substances, 
for half the cost. However, EPA didn't stop there. In wanting to address uh, industry's concerns, the EPA opened up a public comment yet again to consider a reproposal of, uh, of their regulations. Now, I know some people think that EPA has been uh, guilty of a rush to judgment in this, in this regard. And I think if you go through this uh, chronology, just objectively, this is not a, a rush to judgment. And uh, I hope, if nothing else, to convey you tonight that uh, EPA has moved uh, deliberately, some would say, way too slow in order to address this. But uh, there are others who think way too fast, still too fast. But anyway, in the last month, the EPA reproposed the, uh, the Boiler Mac uh, regulation to try to address the stakeholder concerns. And I think they've done a, uh, a workmanlike job, a good job. In this uh, new proposal of the one and a half million boilers in the U.S., less than 1% would be affected, less than 1% would be affected by these uh, emission uh, limits. And when my, uh, ah, here we go, my page comes back, we'll have a chart and see what, uh, what uh, it looks like. This is a good, good way, Mr. President, to actually think of, of, of this. We have uh, this, uh, the pie here represents uh, all the one and a half million boilers in the, the U.S., some very small, and some large industrial boilers. Uh, less than 1% need the technology to, emit, uh, to meet the, uh, the emission limits prescribed by EPA. That's the, the red uh, little tiny slice uh, here. About another 13% of the 1.5 million boilers in the U.S. would need to, uh, to follow uh, really best uh, practice standards in, uh, in ensuring that, that uh, the, uh, the emissions uh, from, uh, from those uh, boilers are, uh, are in, uh, in order. And uh, the rest, 1.3 million boilers, of the vast majority of boilers, it's about 85%, a little over 85%, are not even affected by the rules. Not everybody likes uh, the fact that there are only less than 1% of the boilers are actually be affected by these rules. And uh, not everybody. Some of our friends in the environmental community, understandably, have just been very unhappy with how slowly this whole thing has, has proceeded. But, um, Mr. President, one last thing I want to mention here, maybe two more things. In terms of, uh, from this point forward, uh, how long would uh, these uh, less than 1% how long would they, uh, they have to, to comply with the regs that have finally been promulgated? And uh, the answer is uh, these sources would have, I'm told, up to, up to four years to comply. Up to four years to comply. The EPA is still taking public comment, hopes to finalize uh, this regulation by, uh, by, late, uh, by late spring. The bottom line is, uh, you know, I think we may have uh, delayed long enough. <coughs> Excuse me. Only 1% of our largest sources will need to clean up. EPA has addressed, they certainly have tried to address um, many problems, maybe not all, but many, most. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're still taking public comments. I, um, I'm not sure that uh, we need to delay this uh, boiler mac uh, any further. And um, there are a lot of people who, um, who sneeze during the course of their lives, as I've just done here on the floor. Uh, that was not a, it was just a, a coincidence. A lot of people in, in this country you, who suffer because of the quality of our air. We've made great improvement in cleaning up the quality of our air. We still have a lot of people, too many people, who suffer from asthma, other re uh, respiratory diseases. The kinds of uh, problems, the kinds of emissions that we're talking about here deal less with, uh, with asthma and respiratory diseases. We're talking about uh, substances that uh, can kill people. And in the case of the substances we're talking about here, they have the ability to kill more than 8,000 people a year. 
We don't have many large towns in Delaware. We have Wilmington, which has about, I don't know, maybe 75,000 or so people. We have Dover, central part of our state, we have about 30,000 people. And uh, if you take 8,000 people, that's about as many people as live in any of the rest of our large, well, Newark has about 30,000 people where the University of Delaware is. But other than that, we don't have a lot of large towns. And for us, 8,000 people is, could be the fourth or fifth largest town in my state, just about everybody there. But that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And at the end of the day, we're not going to save, even if these uh, rules are go ahead and are fully implemented, we're not going to save all those 8,000 people. But a lot of those lives will be saved in the coming years. And um, we need to do that. And we need to, uh, to let this process uh, go forward and uh, do our dead level best. The EPA has, I think, tried to, to be responsive to concerns that have been raised. Do our dead level best to provide for a cleaner environment and not to uh, dampen uh, our economic recovery. Last word I would add, the, the, I think uh, the idea that we have to choose one over the other, I believe, is a false choice. We don't have to do that. We can have a clean environment, cleaner environment, and we can have jobs. If you look at the, uh, the growth in our nation's economy since 1970 when the Clean Air Act was adopted, or 1990 when the Clean Air Act amendments of uh, 1990 were adopted, we have seen uh, dramatic growth in our budget. And not in our budget, we've seen growth in our budget too. We've seen growth in our economy. And uh, we've also seen the quality of the air a lot, uh, a lot cleaner over that period of time. So one does not preclude the, the, uh, the other. And uh, some, while some serious concerns have been made about the earlier proposals by EPA, a lot of those concerns have been addressed. We, I think we just need to, to, to get on with it. And with that, Mr., uh, Mr. President, I think we're going to wrap it up here. I think you're going to wrap it up here around about 7.30, which is another 10 minutes or so. And I am looking around. I don't see anybody else waiting to, uh, to, uh, to speak. So I'm going to just note the absence of a quorum and bid you.